Hello and welcome. My name is Alex, and this video is first in a series that will try to explain some concepts and ideas behind of software-defined networking and give you some general first-step guidance on how you can start experimenting with SDN technologies and tools. Before we even start, it is natural that we have to discuss what SDN is and, more importantly, how it happened and why it happened. Well, SDN term appeared more or less simultaneously with an appearance of OpenFlow protocol in Stanford laboratory, and all that together brought a huge wave of hype and startups and new products appearing in market in years that came later. But before even that, it is quite interesting to discuss why those researchers were interested in something like OpenFlow and why software-defined networking are such a buzz in the media. So, as for every technology, SDN has some technological pushes and some societal pulls that allowed and pulled and pushed it to actually appear. Let's, for starters, check this wall of text. This is an excerpt from IETF document that tries to guide new researchers and protocol designers on how, in general, the adoption of internet standards happen. Apparently, it isn't straightforward. We have lots of parties and many different vendors and different entities that we will try to please and documentation to create and many people to, well, understand your protocol before they even start to use it. And it is understandable how IETF or any other standardizing body is conservative. They try to keep network working. But it is also understandable how researchers can be frustrated with this ossified state. And it is natural that we look elsewhere for examples how it can be different. In software world, to create an application, you create your code, upload it somewhere, probably get more developers to work with you, get some users and some media coverage, and there you go. It's like a Darwinian ecosystem compared to the creationist's one, contrasted with a single or, well, multiple governing bodies trying to please everyone. And, of course, those network researchers that look elsewhere now may be thinking that why don't we borrow some concepts of software world into networking? Why don't we create something that will allow us to innovate faster? Naturally, we won't be recreating governing bodies or we won't be creating our own internet. But it is also natural that we'll be quite pleased to have a tool that will allow us to create or experiment with new protocols or new ideas in our networks. Even considering how networks, by their idea, require multiple parties to communicate, still having some tools and ways to rapidly change how networks work is very beneficial to researchers, students, and engineers alike. For the second one, let's take this. This graphic in different forms and colors can be found all over the Internet. And it shows us network virtualization and its benefits comparing to a traditional approach with multiple different kinds of devices and configuration of those. This is something that server admins know for quite some time with VMware and other virtualization products on the market. Now, network virtualization is something new as well, although it happened a year or two before SDN hype started. But it tries to actually satisfy almost the same goals as SDN and to use many similar technologies as SDN. 
So we can say that network virtualization as a thing, as a technology, is an SDN precursor. So technological push is also here, and network virtualization is an ingrained part of most SDN products on the market or even in labs, but it is still something separate. It's been just a technology that allowed SDN to happen. Well, next, let's check this one. Probably most of you know that, but this is a picture that shows us all networks in the internet and how they are connected. Basically, for network engineers, it's a BGP full table view translated into graph. What can be said about it is that it is complex. But you don't have to go that far. Let's take an enterprise network with lots of devices, firewalls, tunnels, configuration and monitoring requirements and policies, security or not to install. Those networks are also quite complex. Take it smaller and ever so popular Wi-Fi mesh with every new node, with every new user, with every new policy, it also gets more complex. Take even a remote office with probably a firewall, couple of VPN tunnels, probably ISP multi-homing. It is quite a configuration to perform and it is quite a requirement on a human resources part and technological part to implement, design and finally to make it work. All what it boils down to is complexity. Take Ethernet, for example. Ethernet happened in 1973 and it was just a wire connecting multiple computers that were speaking to each other sequentially. Not even a hub in there. Yes, we later got hubs, bridges, switches, we got micro-segmentation, and to manage this mess of networks we needed a protocol like STP and this complexity is ever growing. Be it Ethernet or something else, it never grows smaller. So we can say that SDN is some kind of a result of a massive subconscious process happening in minds of all network engineers in the world. And that is that we need to manage this growing network complexity. Networks won't get smaller or simpler. We have to devise some tools to manage them. And that is why. Of course, there are many other reasons and there are many other technological enablers for SDN, but in general, SDN happened due to need of innovate faster due to a need to manage network complexity and thanks to a network virtualization movement that happened barely years before SDN. So what is SDN? Software-defined network actually has no definition. Well, no proper single definition. There are many. And every vendor, every startup tries to bend it in some ways to favor their product to benefit their technology. But with time, the essence started to emerge. And the essence is that software-defined networks is an approach to network design that tries to abstract lower-level functions in a programmable way. Let's try to take it apart. First, it's not a technology, it's not a product, it's an approach or paradigm or philosophy. And it tries to abstract lower level functions, which is, we can see, um, something of a network virtualization kind, so that you can program your network, so that you can manage your network in a programmable way, probably from a remote management station, so that you can write your scripts and applications and services to work on top 
of network. Basically, it is a cloud, but for network. And that's why I like the shorthand for this explanation, network as code, contrasted by server as code approach that happened a couple of years before. Network as code means that we want to have our configuration stored in simple reusable snippets, um, stored in a manageable way like a repository of code, and be applied to our network in bulk so that we can manage our devices, multiple devices, from a single management point. And with time, it became clear that there are many technologies and many approaches, more particular, specific approaches, that satisfy this description, that can be qualified as SDN even if they do not use ever so famous OpenFlow protocol. Let's discuss those kinds of SDN. The first one is just a regular old remote management be it SSH or NetConf or a very new event happening in our networking world, XMPP protocol, that is actually a chat protocol used by Google Talk, but transformed by Juniper uh, Contrail framework to be used as a way for devices to report their state, basically to chat between each other. And whatever protocol you use, there are many devices that are ready to accept the configuration and be managed in that way. You can use as simple thing as SSH, just make it programmable. How do you make it programmable? Well, there are many frameworks that allow you to apply configuration in bulk. Take Ansible, for example, or Puppet. And while those frameworks were designed and created for server world, they are adaptable and can be used in network configuration as well. They will allow you to keep your configuration in small manageable chunks, reuse them, create recipes of configuration, and then apply those recipes to your devices. This is a perfect way if you have a huge set of devices and you want a robust, scalable, proven way of, to manage them SDN-ish style, but it isn't exceptionally innovative. It is clear that you can't design new protocol or new kind of network using traditional devices and traditional configuration. You can, of course, manage them, monitor them, but that's it. Let's take another kind, overlay virtual networks. Well, this kind of SDN is the single one of four that actually has products on the market. VMware NSX, Juniper Contrail, Cisco ACE framework, all those products try to solve a very particular problem, and that is a data center network. For quite some time, we have a very frustrating to network engineers issue with data center networks. And that is a requirement for all VMs to reside in the same Ethernet domain, in the same layer to network. It actually makes us to build networks in a way that they were designed to be. It makes us to break rules just to satisfy this new fangled cloud approach. And that's why this technology actually got most traction. Overlay virtual networks try to solve this exact problem of data centers, try to allow you as a network architect to build your network in a proper way, but then to thread through this network tunnels of layer two over layer three kind, so that those VMs can still communicate in the same layer to domain. Those products reuse well-known protocols they try to solve only this one single problem. So naturally, they are a perfect fit for architect that works with a newly built data center network or a cloud that they try to implement. But again, 
naturally, it doesn't allow us to innovate in extremely new ways or it doesn't allow us to solve different kinds of problems and it actually isn't that useful for networks other than data centers at all. Now, vendor API is something that can be used in almost any kind of network and is much easier to program than just a traditional SSH or NetConf configuration protocol. Vendor API also allows you to use all those vendor-specific features and knobs, but naturally it is vendor-specific. Juniper has one, Arista is very famous for its eAPI, Cisco has two, and if you have a very homogeneous network, if you have single vendor network, that may be a perfect SDN for you. It can be as simple as just a bash or Python script, or it may be a full-blown GUI you will develop with your developers. But calling those API hooks may be a perfect way to remotely and in mass manage your devices and monitor them and configure them and so on and so forth. Again, it doesn't allow us to create truly new protocols, but well, unlike say an ad configuration, it still allows you to use vendor specific features and vendor specific protocols to your benefit. Now, finally, the fourth kind of SDN is probably the one that you've heard most about. It gets, I guess, 90% of media buzz, and this is a separate control plane. That is why OpenFlow protocol was invented. And that is why SDN is so, so revolutionary and orthodox. It's an idea of separating Switch's brain out of the box, moving it somewhere else, be it separate centralized controller or multiple controllers, but talk to this Switch remotely and thus allowing you to reuse simpler white box switches, non-expensive switches that only support this single management interface, OpenFlow. And naturally, most of our course will be concerned with this particular kind of SDN and we'll have a separate video to discuss how exactly separate control plane works and why it is so interesting to us and how it spurs innovation and how it allows you to create new protocols or new features easily, although with some drawbacks. That's it for this video and thank you.